This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Call the Finance Committee meeting of uh, Tuesday, April 20, 2021. To order at two minutes past two o'clock. It's posted as a two o'clock meeting. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18, this meeting of the finance committee is being conducted via remote participation. And as a standard, I will go through um, each of the members of the committee just to make sure that everybody can hear me and we can hear them. And um, then uh, we'll, um, Lynn will put the agenda on the screen for a moment and we'll just discuss the agenda order for the day and uh, proceed accordingly. So uh, going to members of the committee, Dorothy Pam. Present. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. I'm here. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Jane uh, Schiffler. Present. And Kathy Shane. Athena. Here. Yep. Please um, uh, send Pat the, uh, the thing. Okay. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and uh, do you want me to put it up, Linda? Uh, Linda no, I, I have it. No, okay. I have it. Thank you. Okay, so um, just quickly review the agenda. Um, what's going to be somewhat of a time consuming, complicated. Uh, matter is going to be the um, other post-employment benefits discussion and presentation um, because the, there may be a lot of questions about it and it is a uh, pretty complex and um, topic and a major liability of the town um, but um, the uh, presenter from the firm that uh, the actuary is not going to be here till 2 30. So what I was going to propose is that we talk about the auditor procurement and selection process first, um, because Anthony Delaney is present. And then um, that means that if Anthony doesn't want to stay beyond that one agenda item, that it frees his afternoon up um, if he wishes. Um, and of course, the other major item is we do need to return to the regional school budget discussion because we need to make a recommendation to the council on that matter and um, I will then um, see if there's any public present at the moment um, there are there's no members of the public present uh, but we will check again to uh, public comment and then this brief discussion of the budget calendar. And I think those are the agenda items for the day. So with that, if there's, a, unless there's uh, any questions from any members of the committee about the agenda, I would propose that we um, go to what's listed on your screen right now. And then Lynn can take this down. Um, for, we don't, is the, um, auditor selection process and Pat, um, Pat is not going to be able to join us. Which is indeed unfortunate because Pat was the one person who I think was on the original audit committee. She uh, was, but I also was. So was I. And Dorothy. Oh, right? and Dorothy. Thank you. So, so you got us. Okay. Um, so the, we received um, at the council, at the last council meeting, an, uh, a memorandum from 
uh, town manager and with the recommendation for the auditor selection process it included um, a proposed request for a proposal that um, I believe was uh, largely or entirely prepared by Anthony Delaney, who is with us. Um, should there be questions um, that, about that and uh, about the, and then there was also one additional piece, which uh, is the uh, proposed charge for a committee that um, we would need to get back to the council because the council would need to create the committee. Um, and uh, it is um, put together um, according to the memorandum that we received. So um, do we need to have a review of the um, memo and the proposal or has everybody had a chance to read it and feels comfortable with it? I don't hear a request. I'm going to assume that everybody got a chance to read it and doesn't need a presentation. We should just open it up to see if there are any questions or comments. Bob? Yeah, I, I just wanted, there was, um, I'm, I'm not sure what page it's on, but in the, the, uh, the, the scope of work, um, there's a series of number one, number two, number three, and there's, they're not in sort of parallel construction. I mean, one says, you know, prepare a study and then the other, you know, it, it, it's just not parallel construction. Some of it is just, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd have to pull it up to see, but anyway, it's just, it's just, it's a minor thing, but I, I like to see an RFPs you know, kind of parallel construction of scopes of work. Yeah, I can. You have it in or? I can pull it up. You can you okay. can see it on page four, Lynn. Um, what what Bob's talking about? Yeah. So the first one is conduct. The second one says an examination. Mm -hmm. The third is an examination. It's just it's just parallel construction. You know conduct an examination or, you know what I mean? Examine. Or examine, yeah, whatever. Just just um, these things. And then there's, a, I think number six is completely different <laughs> as well. Yeah. When we get, when you can move it down to six, we'll take a look at it. It could be uh, communicate. Uh, right. Yeah, if you just reverse it, say communicate those charges and then put at the conclusion at the as the last clause. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's pretty easy to turn these. Yeah, it's it's not a big deal. It's just it's just kind of a, as I say, it's it's something I like to see in RFPs. <laughs> having responded to dozens, if not hundreds of RFPs in my career. <laughs> Paul, did you add your hand up? Yeah, so we, we can fix that. That's, um, I should have caught that. I didn't when we reviewed this, so we can click fix that easily. Okay, thank you. Dorothy? Well, there are two points I made at the first presentation. And one was, why is 10 years experience not enough? Um, and the second one was, since you ask for a sample audit, uh, yet you do not include it in the point system. So I just would like some clarification on those. Can you give me a page number? That I can't. I actually remembered what I said, which I admit was amazing. But <laughs> okay. There's so many pieces of paper. I'm finding that if I can't remember it, it's never found. Andy, can I respond to yes. Dorothy's first point? Um, so, so after Dorothy's comments at the council meeting, we looked at that um, evaluation criteria as well. And, and we actually, we, I mean, not actually, we do agree that that particular one, we might want to re come revisit and add some more, we can review the, the, the 
amount of time that someone needs for experience. But we were also thinking that we might want to add something to that one about, um, you know, so much experience with um, clients that are a similar size as Amherst, because someone could have, you know, 50 years experience, but it fits with really small towns and that might not be, um, you know, symbolize what they can do for us. So, so we were going to review that um, experience one and, and maybe modify that. Um, and in terms of the years, I mean, the hard thing with RFPs is you have to have, you have to draw a cutoff somewhere at different tiers. The, you know, there's, you have to have this, the same number of tiers for each one. Um, and so we can review those different tiers. You know, I don't think there's a, someone that has 11 years or somebody that has 10 years that there's a huge distinction, but you do have to draw the line somewhere so that you can score them. Lynn, um, that's page eight. But we can review those those different um, levels too. But either way, I think we are going to modify that particular one on experience mm -hmm. to, inc to include something about the size of the, size. of the customers, either add yeah. a new criteria or modify that one. Sounds good. And actually um, the process we assume is uh, what we really need to focus on because I think that it said in the timeline that it wasn't until June that there was a later date for the approval of the um, RFP itself. Yeah, well, we have to post the RFP so that we do have to get the RFP somewhat settled because we have to advertise that and give people time to respond to it. But I think we we did make it so there's plenty of time um, so that, that we, we don't need to rush um, to, to get this done. Do you want to move, you say, approve the RFP document? Uh, do you want to have that earlier than June 21st then? So, um, so when we built this, I mean, I, I see there's sort of two pieces to this that we were looking for your recommendation on. I think the process itself of doing an RFP process and the, and the different steps, and that can include the timeline so we can review the timeline. Um, and then the second piece is the that evaluation criteria that we were just talking about. And then obviously we'll take any input on the sort of the grammatical pieces of that. You can email that stuff to us and we can fix that up. Um, we came up with the June 21st timeline because we were trying to work around the month of May as much as possible for you all, um, because you're gonna be meeting quite often during the month of May and having long meetings on the budget. Um, so I felt like you either you either need to see, you know, approve it before May starts or give you a little bit of time after mm -hmm. May ends to finalize it. Um, but that date, again, we're, we're sort of fluid so that this timeline can fluctuate, um, you know, as long as it makes sense based on the, the meeting schedules. Because you, you, uh, you and Anthony are comfortable with uh, the July 1 publication date is the trigger date for the process. Yeah. And again, if that goes back a week or forward a week, um, that's fine. From a standpoint of council input, I think it would be better to make uh, the RFP document available on June 7th. That way, if there's any changes necessary, we still have the 21st to approve it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Uh, I mean, my suggestion would be in the end is, is a final document that um, change, when you do changes, at least initially to this committee, if you could do um, what, a, a version that shows the edits so that we see where the changes mm -hmm. are as well as the final version, and that'll make it easy for the committee and not have to spend much additional time. Kathy, you have your hand up. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bob drew our attention to the evaluation criteria. And what I looked at was it's not points, but we give you can be an HA, which is you're great, and A is you're pretty good. And then you get down to something less. If there was variation, doing letters like that. So if 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 there were three committee members and they didn't, not everyone gave the same proposal an HA, you'd be averaging HAs and As. So are you thinking that that's like a four three two one or four three two zero? You know that you know the U is kind of no good. 
Um, what, what's your thinking on, I'm assuming you've used this kind of um, weighting system at some other points. So where U, UA means unacceptable, you know, um, to me, if some part of this was a UA, it almost knocks you out, but it certainly knocks you out for that criteria. So I'm just asking what you would do if you had two people rating or three people rating and they didn't all agree. What's your thinking? Andy, can I, can uh, yes. Anthony and I respond to that? Um, so the first, uh, the second part you said there, Kathy, I think you're right. If somebody got a UA, um, that would almost knock them out from the equation because we're saying that that level for whatever it is, you know, we're not going to accept. Anthony, do you want to add a little bit more to how we kind of combine the different ratings to, to at the end to, to rank these or prioritize the applications? Uh, there's not a, uh, there, there isn't a formula really or a, or a rubric. And in fact, we're discouraged from developing one. This, this highly advantageous, advantageous scheme is prescribed in, in chapter 30B. Um, you, if there's an evaluation committee, you'll, you'll generally be coming to some kind of consensus overall. You'll come to some kind of consensus overall rating uh, for how you're recommending these proposals to the town manager. So, um, yeah, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a strict rubric for it, but you, you might say the two highly advantageous and two advantageous scores at average out to an advantageous and Okay. It, and, it, it is, it is was, subject, it's inherently subjective, I guess. Yeah, so I was mainly asking, and just, you know, just when you're doing this cleanup, you've got the four possibilities where U is the lowest, but the next one down has a UA in it. So just yeah, right. clean it up. So it's just a U. Yeah, that's. It's just, it's, yeah. So it's just, mm -hmm. UA would be unacceptable too, I guess, but it's, you'll see in the first thing on, yeah. um, you see that first one, it's UA, then it's a uh -huh. U. Okay, so you, when you, you go the, up. Yeah. I know that Lynn has her hand up. Um, when you go up a little bit higher and you give the definitions, I'm not sure that UA is a dis defined term. No, I think it was just a typo. Um, we'll fix that one. So yeah. it's just you. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, what, that's what I meant, Andy. U was defined. It's only UA only appears in the one. Yeah, everything so that else, was a mistake. Every, it's just a mistake. Everything else is a U. Yeah, so we got that one's noted then. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the one in Lynn, I'll be, just let me say one thing and then I'm going to recognize Lynn. Um, I have one time served on the selection committee like this, and uh, in that experience, um, I believe that we did rate by consensus for as a committee that it was not individual um, ratings that came out, but the consensus rating of the committee after the meeting. So, um, Lynn. My, my questions are along the same line. So let me start. Um, is, do we want each of the three people on the committee to do a review, then have them discuss the consensus um, and based on the interview. And then the next thing is, what is the criteria? Do we have to take best lowest qualified bid or what is the final criteria for our recommendation? I think, I think Anthony wants to Anthony. respond to that one. So Anthony. the... Yeah, so the um, the rule for award, I believe, is actually at the end of section one, right before section two, um, which is, pull it up on my, okay, yeah, uh, it's right at the end of the evaluation criteria. To the responsive and responsible vendor submitting the most advantageous proposal, taking into consideration experience, staff capacity, references, and plan of service, as well as proposal price. Um, so, so that's our, that's our award decision, what our award decision would be based on. Uh, the evaluators will, rank, uh, will 
give overall scores to the proposals, the, and then the town manager will open the price proposals. And if the highest rated proposal is also the lowest bid, then it's an easy decision. But if the highest rated proposal is a more expensive bid, then he has, has to weigh them and, uh, and decide what the best overall award is. So are we making our recommendation to the town manager who ultimately decides? Correct. Wait okay. a minute. The committee makes the recommendation to the town manager. The town manager uh, or actually sends ratings. The town manager makes a decision as to who he recommends, and but it is a council decision as to who gets the award. Yeah, well, RFP, just, RFPs are awarded by the chief procurement officer. That's 30B. Yeah, but the when we get into a problem, which is actually, I'm glad you just said that because that was what my concern was. Um, I'm not sure how we deal with the fact that it is the council that is doing the hiring according to the charter. I, I, all I can assume is that the council has to vote to authorize the manager to enter into X contract. So Andy, can I weigh in on two things real quick? Yes. Um, so just in terms of the process, um, what you said first was correct, which is the, the RFP review committee, you're going to be doing your evaluations and coming up with a consensus evaluation, which is sort of a rating for each application. And then you're going to hand those over to the town manager. You're not necessarily making a recommendation. You're just, you're responsible for evaluating the applications from the quality standpoint. Um, and, and then the town manager will see those ratings, compare them with the price and determine which ones he, he think is the most advantageous for the town. Um, in terms of the second piece, so because this is a, um, so this is exempt from 30B, so that, that adds a little bit of a, a funky wrinkle to it, um, but we are trying to follow a 30B-like process. So because we have this contract set up where it can be over three years, that is the reason why we have it set up as of right now to be brought to the council for final authorization, um, because generally if something's over three years, then it would go to the council. Um, so again, we can, we can look into this more and come back next time once we make some edits to this with some clarification on, the pro on that process, the approval process. But that was the intent of the original, why the town manager would make a recommendation and the council would sort of okay that recommendation and finalize the contract was because of the length of the contract, potentially length of the contract. It was more than the length of the contract because if the council were to disagree um, as far as the uh, who to select, uh, Lynn, if you go near the top of this document you have on the screen, the section of the charter is right there. Yeah, I believe the charter speaks to the council um, determining the process. Yeah, it doesn't say we award the contract, Andy. Yeah, I don't think it says you hire the auditor. I think it just says that you you have to adopt a process for it. But it says shall annually provide for an outside audit of the books and accounts of the town. And the manager is only... Um, is required to provide enough money in the budget to conduct the audit. I think you could read it two ways. It's vague. Definitely <laughs> deliberately. Yeah. I mean, to provide, we just have to make sure it doesn't say anything about three-year contracts. It doesn't say annually contract with. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, no, I really like Paul has his hand up. Paul? Yeah, so I, I think you're you right on the track. It, it, the, what the town council is, you're supposed to adopt the procedures for selection of such an audit accountant or firm. That's what the task is. Typically, all contracts, you know, under the charter, all contracts are signed by the town manager, not by the council. Um, so I think, you know, you can set whatever process you want to, um, and then we will abide by whatever that process is. Um, so I, th I think this is, that's what this discussion is about is, is the process that you want to, to follow. And what Anthony and has put together is 
well, how do we procure other services? We follow 30B. There's a, a fixed set of rules for following 30B. And so that's the process that we put together in this RFP. If the council wants to do a different process, you can choose a different process is what my interpretation would be. Looking to see if there are other comments. Because I'm actually in this funny position because I'm perfectly comfortable with the process as proposed, but just trying to make sure that we're protecting the charter. And I mean, the charters, um, what the charter is authorizing the council to do and how do we do we do we feel that it's appropriate for the council to be charged with providing for an outside audit without having being the one that's finally selecting the auditor uh, Sonia you have some I have a question actually for Anthony and Sean on this um, I, I, it was my understanding that if we don't have to go out to bid for an otter, but if we do, we do have to follow 30 uh, procurement laws. So I don't think we can tailor this. Either we're going out for an RFP and it's following procurement laws or we're not going out for an RFP. So I'm a little confused with that. Anthony, um, why do you do that? Uh, so if it's exempt from 30B, then we don't have to follow 30B in procuring it. I would be very nervous about calling it an RFP and making it look 90% like a 30B RFP, but then having a, a wrinkle that doesn't follow it. If, uh, if we're going to adopt the form and the appearance of it, I'd, I'd like to follow it 100% right. of the way. It's basically my concern. Yeah. Hmm. Bernie Kubiak, did you have... Your hand was up earlier. I just didn't. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say I don't I don't see the conflict between um, the town manager actually um, signing a contract and, and and implementing the audit versus the the council not hiring the person. They're they're uh, they're the firm. And if count the way I, again the way I'm I'm reading this is you know that. It's the council's responsibility to approve a process and then to say whether or not they like the outcome of that process. And if they like the outcome of the process, tell the uh, town manager to, uh, as, as a purchasing agent, to make it so. Um, and I'm also, uh, again, this is a little going backwards a little bit. I'm looking at the minimum requirements. And, um, um, you, you know, if you get, uh, uh, 10 governmental units the size of population of Amherst, uh, you're basically saying to Melanson Heath, uh, give us a contract. <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, there's gotta be a little bit more flexibility in there. <clears throat> but I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm familiar with 30B because I lived with it for 30 years uh, and then some, and, and you know, you, you um, this is a process that, that fairly well parallels, parallels it. I'm not, uh, um, I don't share Anthony's uh, uh, anxiety over uh, uh, following a 30 and making it look like 30B and following it 100%. And I, I do believe that uh, uh, once the council makes the award, it uh, uh, agrees that the process has been followed and makes the, uh, authorizes the expenditure, then it's up to Paul to sign the contract and move the thing forward. Dorothy has her hand up. Yeah, I see Dorothy's hand up. Dorothy? Well, what, what, what I was going to say was clearer before Bernie spoke. Um, I would say, yes, uh, strong government is essential that the uh, town manager, that the, the town council presents a process, makes a recommendation. I wouldn't say award the con you, 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 Bernie used some stronger terms there. I would say the council makes a recommendation and the town manager um, uses his or her discretion and awards the contract. Otherwise, we would not, the town of Amherst is a very contentious town. 
I feel that people would really want to know that it's in the town manager's hands and that the council can't get into some kind of tug of war and um, whatever, or have a split thing. So I, I think it's very important that we keep the words or the understanding that the town council can do the process and make a recommendation. The town manager awards and signs the contract. But Dorothy, I guess I'm still a little bit confused and I do see a couple of hands up is to, um, or, you know, it's not awarding the contract, it's awarding the contract to whom, to what firm. Yeah, that's what I meant. And uh, so the selection of the firm, um, I, I had right. come into today's meeting thinking that the manager was making a recommendation to the council and the council will approve the recommendation and then the manager goes forward and creates a contract. Well, who does the committee report to? Do they report to the town manager or to the town council? Well, if, you, if we go over to that document, which is also in today's packet, the way it's proposed is uh, the recommendation is being made to the town manager. Okay. And then the town manager makes a recommendation to the council and the council says yes or no. Is that right? Yes. If it's a vote, okay, that sounds reasonable. Sonia? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the years of experience and what we're, what, at least what I was thinking about when we were putting that um, in the proposal is that we rely on our auditors a lot for information throughout the year. Like if a new regulation comes through and everything, we call them up and they're right on top of that. They know exactly what we need to do when they work with us on that. So to me, I was looking for, I'm looking for some, an experienced auditing firm that's gonna be able to answer those questions for us. So that's where I was going with the many years and like communities. So I just wanted to explain that. Can I? Yeah, I, I, uh, Sonia, I totally appreciate what you're saying because of my experience with nonprofit audits. Um, it seems to me though that you could have a new firm, but you could have people within that firm who have that level of experience. Yep. Who belong to the professional associations, where they're on top of all of the rules and regulations that apply to municipal government. So I, um, I also think therefore you need to look at the statement and make sure it accounts for uh, the use of resumes um, to show experience for the firm. Okay. But I, I told you, somebody in this, somebody in the group that we hire needs to be extremely educated on state and local municipal finance and uh, on top of what's coming down the road and how we may have to change our accounting procedures to in anticipation of future changes. Let me give a hypothetical situation and see what uh, comments uh, Sonia and John and Paul might have to it. And that is, suppose somebody who we've worked with and have good experience with for a um, period of time at Melanson decides to leave and form his or her own firm or join another firm that is trying to develop governmental, um, municipal governmental work within Massachusetts and relying on that person. Um, would we want to consider that firm's bid or not? And how does that, how would that hypothetical fit into this uh, process that we've set forward? Well, that would depend on the situation. But um, normally, if a firm breaks up like that, you can't do business with the town that your firm you just left from for at least, I think it's two or three years. I'm not sure exactly. But normally, you can't do that. So there's kind of... Mm -hmm. There's a hand-off, there's a, um, a hands yeah. Right. 
could send. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so it would really have to be somebody who has good municipal experience, but from another firm or. It might be bad news for us, but there's nothing we can do about it for a couple of years at least. Right, right. Okay, um, uh, anything else um, we need to cover here? On time, we're gonna need to, um, our guest is here. Yeah, I wanted to move it along for that reason. So Andy, can I just recap what we've heard so far? Yes. So we're gonna take a crack at making some adjustments to the RFP document. Um, I think most of the comments I heard were around the experience and, and um, evaluation criteria, but also the experience um, minimum uh, qualification. And so we're gonna look at those a little bit closer and we will bring back a, a red line version of um, that tracks any changes that we make to the next time for you guys to review. And we'll also in the meantime, we'll, we'll, we'll confirm the process for approving the contract. So next time we can just put that, put that away. Okay, so I'm going to just pause to see I, I'm perfectly comfortable with that is uh, how to conclude this discussion for today. Is there any comment from other members of the committee raise hands so that I know if not, we'll go, we'll do that. And um, okay, so I think that, thank you. That's a good conclusion. Sean, do you wanna um, lead us into the next uh, piece? Because I think that uh, we now have Ms. Uh, Bernabal with us. Yeah, um, so thank you, Linda, for joining us. Linda is, um, I believe the owner of KMS um, Actuaries, right, Linda? Um, and, <laughs> and Linda and I have spent a lot of time uh, talking this year. Um, we had a longtime actuary, uh, Daniel Sherman, who you may all remember, who retired last year. And so we went out um, with Anthony's help. We went out to um, procure a new actuary and Linda won that procurement. And she has come highly recommended from everyone we've spoken to. Um, she audits some other large systems. She's the auditor for the Hampshire County Retirement System. Um, our auditors were familiar with her and, and spoke very highly of her. Um, and so we, you know, we've learned a lot. And um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it off to to Linda to walk us through the OPEB valuation that we just conduct. Uh, it was based on June thirtieth, twenty twenty, I believe, is the at least the disclosure date. Um, and Linda can give us more details on that. Great, thank you, Sean, and thank you all for um, inviting me to your finance committee meeting. Um, Sean, did you want to give me some sharing rights or maybe Athena does for yeah. the PowerPoint presentation or do you, would you rather just everyone no, may have it? Let's get, we're gonna get, um, Athena, can you give sharing rights to Linda? Because I think because of the number of slides, it made more sense for Linda just to navigate from slide to slide. Yep, you should be able to share screen down at the bottom. Yeah. You all see that? Yep. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So we are here to talk about the um, OPEB valuation. OPEB meaning other post-employment benefits, and it's other than what? It's other than a pension plan. Um, New Ham or Hampshire retirement system is a pension benefit provided to the employees of Amherst. Mass teachers retirement system is a, again, pension system that basically pays the benefits to your teachers within the town. But this is the other, they, and it was a standard put forward by the GASB uh, to recognize the promises made for the liabilities associated with, it's pretty much retiree medical. Um, dental might fall in there or some other smaller benefits, but you know, for the most part, we're talking about the promise to pay your retirees or, or contribute a portion of that benefit uh, once retired and to be covered under your health insurance program. So that's what we're talking about today, different than pensions. Um, so we're gonna just kind of go over what is OPEB? What do we mean by that? What are the accounting standards that um, are basically uh, you know, subject to these OPEB standards? 
Um, we're going to talk about the valuation, what we kind of do to do that. And then we're going to talk about what everybody usually likes to talk about is, okay, are these numbers for real? Um, are, is there any way to control these numbers? Every time we get a report, we feel like the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those things. Okay, so just as an introduction, uh, my name is Linda Bourneville. Sean is right. I am the owner, founder of KMS Actuaries. Uh, we're a small firm located in southern New Hampshire. Uh, we have three full-time employees, and as of yesterday, one part-time employee. It is my husband who does all of our business kind of stuff, and he just went out and retired on me. So um, he's our part-time employee, but we have one other credentialed actuary, and all that means is that we have spent a better part of our young adult lives taking exams to earn credentials to do actuarial work. Um, so these letters next to my name but pretty much are described underneath. Um, the most important credential we have though is the MAAA. That means I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. That is the group who, um, as, as a member of it, we are responsible for a code of conduct as well as actuarial standards of practice. And what that does is it gives the public some comfort in the work that we do. We follow these cookbooks that are kind of presented and prepared by the membership. We are a self-regulating organization or a self, we're not like the CPAs who have the AICPA kind of overlooking their work. We actually are self-regulated. There are no state um, agencies or anything like that who overlooks our work. So we have these things called the ASOPs where um, again, gives us kind of a cookbook to, to do the work. Um, I have over 30 years of experience doing this stuff, most of it in the public sector. Um, back in 1988, actually, when Mass passed um, its retirement laws on pre-funding retirement benefits, I was at William Mercer in the very infancy of my, you know, my career uh, and worked on those retirement systems. So very familiar with public, public sector. It is a pretty much uh, about 95% of our business at KMS is with the public sector. So we do a lot of this work uh, throughout. Um, okay, so what again, kind of already touched on the other post-employment benefits. Um, what we're doing is we are trying to measure that promise that the town made to its retirees. And that promise, right, was is made while you are actively working but it's sort of a, you know, in writing, there is this document that says, but upon retirement, you know, we're gonna pay for some of your health insurance. Generally, the accounting, accounting profession looks at that as deferred compensation. You are kind of deferring some cash in hand at the time when you're 20 years old, 30, 40, 50, while you're working to provide for something once retired. Well, you gotta somehow measure that, but it's something that's going to happen in the future. So thus an actuary comes in because that's our expertise is that we build models based on a current membership today to predict some costs that aren't gonna happen for sometimes 50, 60 or 70 years into the future. Some people call it actuarial mumbo jumbo. Um, it is a big model. There's a lot of assumptions that go into it. Uh, so, and, and we'll go over the, the more, you know, the more important of those assumptions and, and how we do that. So one of the things, once we disclose these liabilities, you know, what are they used for? Well, they're gonna go on the balance sheet for one thing in the town's financial statements. Um, and then there's an expense calculation that will go on your P&L. Um, but one of the things that's also happening at the same time here is that the town is actually setting aside funds to pre-fund this benefit. Similarly, the way Hampshire County Retirement System sets aside and has done so since 1988 to pre-fund some of the benefits. The goal is at some time that that trust fund will be large enough that no more monies would be needed to be raised and appropriated through taxes but that you could actually draw the benefits that are paid. And what is that? It's a percentage of the premium paid for your retirees out of that trust fund, okay? Now that was a decision made by the town because nobody, including the GASB or the state Commonwealth of Massachusetts requires pre-funding OPEB benefits. As you know, uh, Massachusetts law does require pre-funding retirement benefits. All right, so for mass uh, retirement systems like the Hampshire County system or the mass teachers system, 
there is pre-funding going on, but that is not really required um, in the municipalities for OPEB. Uh, but many towns and cities have opted to do so for the reasons we're gonna go, you know, get into those a little bit more, what some of the benefits of that pre-funding is. So just keeping that in mind, the GASB is not telling you to fund. The, what the GASB is giving us the cookbook for is how to prepare these liabilities that are going to land on your balance sheet. Okay, so kind of what I just said, the Government Accounting Standards Board, they're the uh, governmental agency that um, kind of promulgates these statements that are, um, that are applied here. And this is GASB 74 and GASB 75 uh, under the GASB standards. Your auditors, which I heard you speak a bit of right before I got on the call, your auditors are going to take that information from our reports. They've, they're, you know, part of their due diligence is making sure the assumptions that we've chosen are reasonable within their area of expertise of knowledge of this stuff. Um, but they're going to take these accounting principles and apply the work that we do to land them properly onto your financial statements. Um, again, I said I'm a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. Uh, we have a code of conduct as well as actuarial standards of practice. And, and so these kind of three pieces are what we use to build the model. All right, so there are many assumptions in this model <clears throat> that are used to, again, predict what are we going to be paying out into the future. And then we're gonna try to put a number on that that is meaningful as of June 30th of every fiscal year. This report results are as of June 30th of 2020. Um, it's not old, you know, it's, it is just the most recent one that we've done. We do these uh, reports every year and they are to be reported on your June 30th financial statements. And we're not there yet. We're not at 2021 yet. And we can't really begin the work until after the end of the, the close of the fiscal year. So similar to the auditor's work, we do the work once the year is over. But the discount rate is the rate that you're gonna hear most people talk about. Uh, it is the assumption that is by far the most important assumption that we need to establish. And this page is thick with sort of a methodology that um, could be intuitive when you think about it. Again, we are trying to predict these payments being made out into next year, the year after, their year after that, 50, 60, 70 years into the future. How do we discount those rates or those benefits back to the present? And we now have assets set aside that technically is what we want to earn enough interest, right? We want, to, we want some investment return on those assets to pay for some of these benefits. So our first um, kind of order is that we have to look at what do you have in the bank? What is What are your assets that are set aside? Do you have enough assets set aside at this point to pay for one year of benefit payments? If we think you do, and it's easy, you give us a statement that has your OPEB trust balance and we discount that first year of benefit payments we think we're gonna have to pay using that long-term rate of return. We do look at that in the second year, we ask the same question, do you have enough assets in the bank year, two years from now is there enough to pay for? We keep looking at that. And what the GASB says is you may keep using your long-term rate of return until you run out of assets. Well, for the town of Amherst, because you have enough assets set aside and you have a funding policy that kind of keeps replenishing the assets as they're paid out, we can predict that you will, at this point in time, not run out of money. And that's a good thing. That means we get to use your long-term rate of return as the discount rate for every single year into the future. What is that long-term rate of return? Well, we look at your OPEB trust. We look to see how it's invested. Is it mostly equities? Is it fixed income assets? What is it invested in? We look at the capital markets and we try to assign a long-term rate of return for this portfolio that the town has adopted. And at this point, we're at a 7.3% invest, long-term investment return rate. Don't hold on to that and bring that to the bank and ask for 7.3 returns on your money. This is a very long-term outlook. This is over 30 years because, you know, think about that. We've got liabilities in here who aren't, that aren't going to be paid for many, many years, okay? 
The other thing too, um, this is as of June 30th of 2020 when we were looking at this, probably in the fall, the pandemic was what, you know, we were well into that. The markets were starting to react to the pandemic. And so a lot of those, especially the fixed income securities, those outlooks have outlooks have pretty much significantly declined over the year. So what's probably going to happen when we look at this again in 2021, that 7.3 is likely going to be a little bit lower. So we look at that every single year. We look at the OPEB trust, we look at the investment policy statement, and we decide what we think is the best, um, the best discount rate to use. In discount rate liability terminology, the lower the discount rate, the higher the liabilities are. Okay, because that means my assets, I, I'm not expecting as much return, right? That means I need more in the bank to fund the same benefit. So as that discount rate drops, your liabilities are gonna go up. All right, there's also a municipal bond rate that we need to use in, in analyzing this discount rate because you quote, won't run out of money, you are not subject to those municipal bond rates, but you can kind of see, I have that on slide six, the difference in just one year made, it was over 130 basis points change between the two years. Good for municipal financing if you needed to go out for a bond and borrow money, not so good when you need to report a liability. All right, so that's kind of the story of the discount rate and how we develop that rate. All right, so we know the purpose of the valuation, we're gonna periodically review the liabilities and the assets and periodically means every June 30th because that's your fiscal year end. We're gonna make sure that all those assumptions and methods that we use every time are appropriate. They're consistent from year to year. They're reasonable, you know. You, you know we would not be allowed to use a long-term rate of return like eight, eight and a half, nine percent, even if your portfolio, you know, returned all of those returns historically. We don't look back. We always try to look forward on what our expectations are going forward. So once we can, you know, we have all this, uh, these liabilities and assets kind of measured, we are able to develop all the accounting disclosures that you'll need under the standards. We can calculate what's called an actuarially determined contribution. What do you think you should be funding every year to get to fully funding this liability? And then what about, what about our benefits? What, what about if we change our cost sharing arrangement with retirees and we go from 20% to 25 or 30%? Or what if we remove the life insurance component of this benefit? Mm -hmm. So we can do some benefit option calculations to see what the impact is. Okay, so what did we find out in 2020? We look at your assets and the assets are not quite hitting our expectation, but that's okay. Cause we relook every year and we kind of reset the, you know, we reset things. This is still a small trust compared to the liabilities that are, um, that are value, but so we're a little under 2% as of June 30, 2020. And that's been kind of typical. The June 30 marks have been a little bit lower um, than say December 31. December 31 tends to be a little more volatile. And you would see that if you saw the returns like for the Hampshire County Retirement System. Uh, kind of thing, the kind of things we include in our model, if you know the Cadillac tax, it was part of the Affordable Care Act that said, if you have a Cadillac tax, you are going to um, pay a 40% excise tax every year on um, some, you know, the excess of the value of that plan over some threshold. Well, in December of 2019, that was repealed. So we pull it out. And, and what we say is if we think that, you know, if the retiree is gonna pay 25% of the premium for your plans, they're probably going to have been charged the 25% of this Cadillac tax. It never actually really came into being because it kept being deferred on when it would become effective. I believe it started in 2018, it got deferred to 2019, and then it got deferred to 2022. We value it because remember, we're putting forward a model for future expectations. So we had some expectation that in 2022, a tax would kick in, it's gone now. We compare what did we have in 2019 compared to what we had in 2020 and what's going to um, be some things that create gains or losses. Well, your, your health insurance premiums change every year. So we're gonna be looking at that. 
you're going to have different people. Um, you know, perhaps some uh, older retirees are living longer than we expected. They might be staying in. Maybe you hired five more people than you had in the, in the valuation before. So there's all kinds of experience gains that go on or losses. Uh, we had about a $3.6 million gain in this particular valuation. Um, for OPEB valuations, those are very hard to kind of predict because we're not quite sure how your health insurance premiums are going to fare in the future. We have an assumption for that, but I can tell you that we are never going to hit that assumption. We're trying to kind of get it on average okay, but there may be some gains and losses that are going to be, um, that will emerge. And assumption changes, that's again, looking at our model, what's, what, what makes sense? I mentioned that we did have a reduction in that long-term rate of return because the market outlook had, is kind of dropping. So we had an assumption change that brought us down from the seven and a half to 7.3. Here's just a little screen on your membership. Um, you can see, and, and again, don't, don't think the town of Amherst hired, you know, 10 more people. It, this could just be a point in time in which the data was collected, right? So maybe there were some teachers who retired and left on June 30th who weren't quite, re, you know, quite replaced at that point. You'll never see this thing, even if you have sort of a no gain, no loss um, total employees, you, you're going to see like a little bit of fluctuation there. And then, of course, your retired employees and survivors. Um, retired employees can cover their spouses, so there'd be some of those in here. Um, and then the survivors would be the, um, the retiree has since passed, and the survivor would be their spouse who is covered under the plan. Um, who's generally included in this valuation? It's usually the same people who are covered under your retirement systems, the Hampshire County retirement system, as well as mass teachers. Uh, so it's more like, you know, definitely the full timers, there may be some hour requirement for you to um, actually be eligible for the OPEB program, it's, but it's generally not, you know, the seasonal kid you hire to um, take care of your landscaping at the town hall in the summer. It's generally not those people. Linda, can um, I just add one quick thing here? Yeah. Um, and just correct me if I'm wrong. So just for those watching, this number includes town employees and Amherst public school employees, which is the elementary school system. It doesn't include the region or Pelham, um, who again, we kind of go together as a group for health insurance purposes, but for this valuation purpose, they get their own OPEB valuation. So they're not part of this number, um, but the elementary schools are because they're under the town umbrella. That's exactly right. There are some towns that have full regional school districts that have no teachers. There's others that are the opposite that have all the towns from K through 12. Um, but this group is split. Um, we do also, as sort of a group project, we, we do the town of Pelham and the school district. So we kind of know who's in where and who needs to be put in what, what report and what category. So good point, Sean, that um, there were some teachers who are not included. Okay, so our model has sort of three components. We just talked about the census data. That's part one. Sean and group and Holly provide us with you know, a file with every employee and every retiree and their health insurance information. Do we want to stop for questions? I'm totally cool with that. Are there questions? I see a hand up. Um, mine, is, mine is just on two things you're about to say on how many pre-Medicare people do we have and how many do we have our non-Medicare where our system is paying for all of them. Um, just a question on of that 504, I wanted to know how much um, this system is having to cover. Okay, I will have to go back to the report. Hold on. I have your report open as well. If, it, if it's in the main report, I can find it. So if section just... seven, section okay, seven of the report will list how many retirees and spouses are in each of the plans. And, and it's like subcategorized as non-Medicare and Medicare. Okay. I'll find it. Now, yeah. Yep. Now you point, you brought up a great point um, to talk about the health plans. Once somebody is 65, generally they are eligible to join Medicare, right? Um, and these are retirees, by the way, while you're active, this rule doesn't really apply. Um, in the old days, 
they left it up to the local towns and cities to force those 65 Medicare eligible retirees off of their HMO type plans and onto Medicare supplemental plans. A few years ago with um, health reform, the Commonwealth put that in statute that now like they're the bad guys. The state is now like requires the locals to really kind of keep track of this and you know, find out who are your retirees who are becoming Medicare eligible and making sure they do move over onto the Medicare supplemental plans. Those are extremely less expensive than keeping them on an HMO. What's gonna happen if you keep older retirees on an HMO, those people, not only are you paying a lot more out of pocket for them when they really don't need to be, but they're also part of your experience rated group of all of your active employees. So they are creating higher premiums for everybody if you keep 70 and 80 year old folks onto your, on your pre-Medicare plans. So it's always a good thing to require Medicare eligible retirees to elect a Medicare eligible. Um, and I have that in the second bullet there. Um, so we look at the health plans of all groups. The pre-Medicare plans are those retirees who are under 65 generally and are on the active plan. So the plans that your active employees are actually covered under, your, these retirees are part of that group as well. Then once again, you become eligible for Medicare um, and then you would go and elect a supplemental plan. Um, your town provides a <clears throat> variation depending on the plan you select of the reimbursement or the, the, part, the portion of the premium that your retirees contribute. So it's somewhere in 20 to 25% range. Uh, that falls in line with about the average in Massachusetts on what the what we call the employer subsidy. It's somewhere between 70 and 73%, I believe, of what the employers are contributing. Um, the law actually requires no more than 50% you can charge your retirees. So you are a little um, lower than, in other words, you have some cushion there to possibly um, increase your retiree contribution rate, but you are not up to the maximum at this point. Um, part of the Part B premium, and that's the Medicare Part B, is actually reimbursed by the town as well. That's again only kicks in once a person turns 65, is retired, and is on Medicare. Um, and then th these are like, you know, it truly is the proverbial drop in the bucket when you start looking at life insurance compared to health insurance. Uh, the premiums are quite insignificant, but it is an OPEB benefit. It is contributing toward a life insurance policy for your retirees. So these are the plan provisions, kind of part of the cookbook, right? We've got our data, we've got our plan provisions, and then we have our assumptions that are put into the model to develop these liabilities. I already beat the long-term investment return rate of return concept to death, so we're going to skip over that and the discount rate, same terminology, the long-term rate of return, the bond rate, we look at those two together to come up with the discount rate. And that's what you'll see throughout the report. Um, the next most important assumption is the healthcare cost trend rates. And that's what I was getting at earlier in that you, we have some premiums that we know about today, right? What the town is paying for the active employees, the pre-Medicare -re, pre retirees, as well as your Medicare retirees, but next year, what is, what is that going to be? Well, you probably haven't even gotten your new enrollments yet um, to get your new rate. So we have to put in an assumption for that. So what our assumption currently is 7% increase for the first year. It drops, I believe, to 6.55 in the next year. It kind of keeps grading down to an ultimate rate of 4%. It goes for a long time, this grading, out to 2075. Um, Society of Actuaries actually has built a trend model that we use. We put in inputs such as inflation. Um, we look at your plans to see if they kind of fall within, you know, typical, typical plans in Massachusetts, and they do. Um, and that's how we come up with this healthcare trend rate. Well, what's going to happen in two years when we do the next valuation? You know, will your rates have gone up 7% in the first year and 6.55? I can pretty much with confidence tell you no, you know, but that's our model. And that's what we're going to have to kind of reconcile 
when we go do the next valuation. And that is, what are the premiums that you're now charging two years later? And how do those compare to the health trend rate? Um, and that's an experience gain or loss. If they went up more than we thought, that's a loss, right? And if they went down, you know, or if they went up less than we thought, you'd have an experience gain in that situation. Um, a couple of the other, you know, more, I wanna say um, important um, assumptions under the health side is a participation rate. We don't think that every retiree who leaves Amherst or every employee who leaves Amherst at retirement is going to elect coverage. Why is that? Well, maybe they have a spouse still working. Maybe they have a spouse who works at a place that offers better benefits at retirement. So there is some selection here on whether or not people are going to elect. So we do say that only 75% will actually elect coverage upon retirement. That could also create a gain or loss because if at the end of the day, 100 people retired and you've got 80 people who elected coverage, well, guess what? There's, a, there's an experience loss again because more elected it than not. By the way, you do not have 100 people retiring in a year. That was just an example to you know, make the math easy. Um, and then you know, I, I did mention that you can cover, a, a retiree can cover a spouse as well. So we need to also figure out, well, you know, not everyone's married. Not every spouse wants to elect. They might work and get benefits somewhere else. So we think that only, you know, at this point, 60% of somebody who actually elects coverage will elect a covered spouse as well. Um, and then payroll growth, that is really more for how we bring numbers forward in future years. And we assume payroll growth. This benefit has nothing to do with payroll, but the GASB wants us to use a method that kind of assigns payroll. So that's an important assumption in some of the modeling that we do, um, especially to create the discount rate. So now we got our three pieces. We've got data, we've got plan provisions, and we have assumptions, economic. We also have some demographic assumptions. Um, for OPEB, for us, it's easy for us to select these assumptions because we look to the retirement systems that your employees are covered under. Um, and being the actuaries for Hampshire County, we don't even have to ask anybody what those assumptions are because we pick them. Um, and what are those other assumptions? Well, when are people going to retire? Not everyone leaves at 65. You know, Some public safety employees are able to leave at 55 with full benefits under, under Hampshire County. Um, so we have a whole lot of um, different rates for retirement, becoming disabled, terminating, dying before you even retire, you know, eligible to retire by all three types of employees. General are your, you know, like Sean is a general employee, sits at a desk mostly. Public safety will be your police and fire, possibly some EMTs um, and other maybe light, light department types. Um, and then of course your teachers. Um, and then mortality is another very important assumption. It really comes down to how long do we think people are going to live? So in an annuity type benefit such as this, you know, you're paying a piece of something, a piece of their premium every single year for as long as they live. Um, if you live long, then these liabilities are going to be bigger. So our assumptions are trying to match reality to some point. So uh, we, we, continually look at that mortality assumption and, and continually improve it. Although currently the, the jury is out on whether there is gonna be some you know, peak of this mortality improvement and will the next generation actually uh, maybe live as long as we are. <coughs> Pardon me. So as I mentioned before, statement disclosures, um, the net OPEB liability, and why is it net? We subtract the assets you've set aside from these liabilities. Those are gonna be on your balance sheet, the town's balance sheet, uh, effective June 30, 2020, and every year thereafter. Uh, the financial statements will have a section in the notes with um, a nice since 2017 building of this OPEB liability for anybody who, you know, you can look at it. Our reports also show the full since the beginning of these standards. We're gonna show kind of like the progression of how these things are changing. The OPEB expense is really, how does that net OPEB liability change year over year with a few exceptions? We get to defer some of the items in that change. Um, and that's all detailed in section four of our reports on, in our report on how that expense is computed. So uh, sorry, I forgot to add a very important um, 
note in this slide, and that is all numbers are in millions here. Um, it's not $75, it is 75 million. Um, so this is your total OPEB liability. It's taking that model and developing these liabilities under all those assumptions, your data and your plan. Um, you had, and this is as of June 30, 2020, $7.3 million in the OPEB trust. Um, I'm not gonna put Sean on the spot, but do you know where that is at this point? Maybe a little higher? Um, yes, I think it is a little higher. We have another, uh, we would have made another contribution this year. I'm not sure if we've made it yet. Um, and I believe the returns have been doing pretty well, uh, but I don't have an exact number. I can get that. Yeah, so that's like every day, right? I always say your unfunded or your funded ratio or your net OPEB liability. It's a very changing thing, but this is a snapshot on June 30th of 2020. So on that day, that was 7.3 million. As Sean said, every year the town is making more contributions. There's investment gains and losses, hoping the gains are more than the losses. And that should be building as we go. You can see just in the one year period, it increased um, over 20%. Your fiduciary net position, by the way, is the auditor's words or, or nomenclature for the OPEB trust assets, okay? Kathy? I, is that um, okay? I'm, I don't mean to overstep the chairs. Yeah, um, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sorry. I saw the hand. Yeah, no, it, um, on the expected benefit payments, um, it's a 32% increase. And I went back and looked at the number of people you expect to be in, which wasn't a 30%. So is that, um, what, where does the 32% come from? Okay, so expected benefit payment is going to be in our model, what do we expect the following year's payments to be? What are they? What do we think they are? And that's with, we've got a premium at the Val date. We're gonna increase the premium. We've got perhaps maybe some new retirees that we didn't consider. Why did it increase so much? Sean, I think this was because we think the Part B reimbursement was not valued. We didn't do the June 30, 19 valuation. So we kind of had to go from a report only that we knew about, right, and, and kind of go forward. And so our liabilities went up pretty significantly as well. I think it might have been the Part B was probably a big piece of that. And that was like $10 million, I think. Yeah, there was, um, sorry, just real quick. Um, yeah, there was one piece that um, the previous actuary did not include in our OPEB liability, um, and it was the Medicare Part B piece. And I, and I don't um, know enough about the actuary practice to know, you know, if it was um, sort of discretionary, whether or not that was included. But um, when Linda reviewed everything, she felt pretty strongly that that should be included in our OPEB liability. So that was a mm -hmm. hopefully a one-time um, sort of adjustment transitioning um, between two different actuaries. Um, but it was a one-time sort of big increase uh, in our liability. So it's not in the base of 2019, but now it's in 2020. So that right. So part of that 26.6 percent increase that you see, there's sort of a you know two or three components that make up that increase. But one of the big pieces was the inclusion of the Medicare Part B um, mm -hmm. into the into the mix that makes up our total liability. So what share of Part B do we pay um, as a town? I don't need an answer right now. Yeah, I just, we can get to that. That's section five. Section five. Of our thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm cross looking at you yeah. guys aren't easy. I'll tell you. It was like a kind of complicated. No, no. I just that's one that I, I up to a certain number, but then you compare it to some other thing. And I think yeah. for like survivors, it may be something actually even different. But section five does um, explain okay. our plan provision and it would be in there. Yeah, I didn't realize the town did that. So thank you. And the one other thing I just wanted to add um, as well, um, enterprise funds are all part of this as well. So sewer, transportation, water, and um, solid waste, um, they're part of the total liability number, but they're also making contributions each year, or at least the ones that can afford to make contributions are making contributions each year. Um, so it's not just the OPEB that's in the general fund in terms of the contribution. It, there's also contributions um, in water and sewer, and I think a little bit in transportation. And now that I'm looking at your OPEB expense, how it went up by $10 million. So a, we kind of looked at this as a benefit change. We didn't really know where to put it. The GASB doesn't give us a lot of choices. It's either an experience gain or loss, a benefit change, 
or an assumption change. Benefit changes under GASB 75 are immediately recognizable. In other words, you can't defer any of it. So that's like that. That's it was. I remember it was ten million dollars. So there's the difference between the expense in one year is that we had to put it somewhere for that change. Um, but again, that fourteen point nine million dollars will probably come down more to like the five million in future years. It's a. It was a one-time fix. Um, it is a benefit payable to a retiree as part of his, you know, medical uh, package, if you will. So it, it is technically OPEB. Um, so this is um, this is all summarized in our reports. And as Kathy was asking the questions, like you know, all of the, I want to say, our inputs are disclosed in the report. Section five is the are the plan provisions. Section six are the assumptions. Section seven are, is the census data. So that's like kind of the three pieces of the model and then all the results are in front of that. So you got your five, six, and seven. Uh, Sean mentioned the enterprise funds. We actually also provide breakouts of um, the results in section nine of our report um, for um, each of those like the water and sewer and those groups. Okay, and, and this is kind of what I was getting at that there's certain things we recognize in expense and um, you know, expense is going to, or your liabilities are gonna kind of go up for you know, common reasons. One, every year somebody, somebody works one minute, they're earning a new benefit. That's what the service cost is. It's the value of the benefit that your active employees earned in the current year. So you're always gonna add that. Interest, right? We know that in our mortgage payments, there's always interest applied on the balance from the year before. That makes your liability go up. But then if you pay in your payment, your liability should come down. So there'll always be a service cost and an interest cost in your kind of moving your total OPEB liability from beginning to end of the year. Um, and as I pointed out in the, um, the these check boxes, the difference between expected and actual experience, those gains and losses, we get to defer some of those because the GASB said, we don't want your expense to kind of be wildly variable. So you can defer over a period of time, some of that gain and loss. The benefit terms though, what they say is benefit terms are subject to or under the control of the plan sponsor. So they don't give you a break there. They say, if you're gonna change benefits, um, you're gonna have to immediately recognize those. And that's in either direction, by the way, we had to add that part B reimbursement, but if say you took it away, it would be a minus in your expense year. And assumptions and then earnings on your OPEB assets also get to be deferred. Again, under the theory that we don't want much, we're trying to nail this down in a model. And if you start looking at market values and how fluctuating they can be, um, we wanna be able to defer some of those gains and losses. And if you have, but you do not pay out administrative expenses out of the trust, um, you would immediately recognize those as well. So it's just sort of a little schematic on how we look at this expense and change in our liability. Um, okay, so some of the things people always ask me about is, oh my gosh, you know, FinCom is asking, why is this number so big? What do we do? What do we do? Um, you know, the, the, the three pieces that I, that I talk about, the plan, the data, right? Your census. Well, you know, if you hire the people that you need to run the town, I just can't imagine that you're going to hire the people and say, we don't want those people because we have these benefits we have to pay for. You know, so there's that fine line. Um, so you've got your census data, you've got your program, the plan that you're offering, um, and then you have our assumptions. So assumptions, I can change liabilities easily, right? I could change that 7.3 back to 7.5 and down go your liabilities or whatever. But again, we are bound by um, the ASOPs where those have to be reasonable. So what has happened over the past few years? Well, back in 2012, pension reform came along and you're saying, well, well how can pension reform change OPEB liabilities? Well, what it did is it said for anyone hired after April 1st of 2012, in order to retire under a full mass retirement benefit, meaning no reductions, you now need to wait till you're 60 instead of 55 for certain things. So. Um, those are for your public safety. For general employees, it delayed from 65 to 67. Well, in pensions, that doesn't really mean a big deal because all you're really doing 
you're going to be reducing benefits if you retire early. Think about OPEB though. OPEB has no reductions for early retirement. A premium is a premium, regardless of your age. So if you retire at 55, right? And now I'm going to pay for a portion of that HMO for 10 years, right? Well, if it's, it's just 10 years and it's going to go up because premiums do generally go up. But what if I d defer and don't allow that 55 year old to really retire till 60? Now I'm down to five years of that more expensive HMO type program. But just because I retired at 55 doesn't mean I got a lower benefit. So OPEB is very expensive when you allow people to retire early. So what pension reform did is it pushed a lot of people into a different category of retirement. And because we use the Hampshire County retirement assumptions, it actually reduces OPEB liabilities because we're thinking um, retirement is really what's going to, you know, or somebody's retirement benefit, I think is what goes through their mind on when they're gonna retire. When am I gonna retire? I'm gonna retire when I get my full 80% of salary. I need 32 years in order to do that. Or I wanna, you know, wait till I'm 65 because I'm gonna get a better benefit or 67. So it does push things off. Um, believe it or not, from 2012, uh, all the hires post 2012, April of 2012, about half of your employees are already in that category. All right, so, so the older folks, they're hanging on, they're gonna stay there because they got a better pension benefit, right? And they're gonna retire under the old pension rules. So pension reform helps OPEB. Um, Pre-funding to an OPEB trust, Kind of already talked about that because we get to use a lower discount rate. So that's something that, that impacts the assumption we use to value, um, to value the benefits. I mean, and that's, you know, that's one of the pieces currently, but later on, you know, what is the purpose of a trust? Well, you want to be able to pay out these benefits, that 20 to 25% of the premium out of that trust, because you want your trust to work for you. You want investment return to accumulate in the trust and use that rather than raising and appropriating taxes, right? So you're trying to use the trust just like retirement uses the trust with the investments that it earns, investment return that it earns to pay benefits. In very mature pension systems, about 60% of the benefits are paid with investment return, all right? So that's the goal, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like what you want to do. Yeah, Linda, I think that there was a question from Dorothy Pam. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Um, so um, I'm still thinking New York City in lots of ways. Uh, police and fire have early retirement. In Amherst, um, are police and fire on this same um, schedule? So police and fire. So in Massachusetts, they call it the multiplier. You get a multiplier times your years of service. And the, the maximum multiplier is two and a half percent. A general employee Gets, and a general employee hired before April of 2012 gets that two and a half percent multiplier at age 65. Public safety gets that two and a half percent multiplier at 55. So all things being equal, if you have a group, they're called group one and group four. If you have a group one employee, they earn the exact same amount of money they earned um, or they retired group one at 65, group two at 55 with the same number of years. They've had the same benefit, but the 55 year old is going to get it paid over a longer period of time. So that liability for him is much higher. Okay. So group four employees on both OPEB and pensions are much more expensive than uh, group one employees. Um, another question, it's public works there? Because I mean, a lot of them just, do manual labor. I mean, I mean, the big distinction sometimes is people who do jobs which are physically challenging as opposed to desk work. So does- I'm pretty sure the public safety is, is pretty much restricted to your police and fire. Mm -hmm. um, hazardous, I think it's more hazardous. I know there's some election by local boards to adopt EMT coverage as group four. Mm -hmm. um, electric light departments, those guys who climb the poles, guys and gals, I should say, who climb the poles could be hazardous. I believe those, and I'm not sure if that's a local option or if that's automatic, but most electric light um, employees that we see are group fours. I don't know about public works. I'm kind of thinking, no, I'm thinking um, those folks are still group one. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So 
what do you do to get there? That's another question we get a lot is how do we get that OPEB trust fully funded? These plans are in their infancy. I'm gonna flip back a bunch of slides where we talked about you know the funding, we're like at 10% funded, all right? Not like pensions right now that are mostly like 60 and above, uh, most I have to say, but you know the fun the funding of OPEB is kind of in its infancy in many places all over the country. Um, Ten percent is probably you know on the high end in Massachusetts, believe it or not. So um, what some and many towns are doing is they're looking at ways to you know systematically fund for this benefit. So the town has adopted a funding policy, and Sean and I are kind of talking about that and still talking about it to see. Uh, we could probably do some modeling of what where you are and how you're going to get there. Um, there's a whole lot of different ways to skin this cat, right? Many towns don't really fund what's called an actuarially determined contribution, like retirement systems do. Many say, here's my dollar amount that I can afford. Here's a percentage of my budget. My budget goes up 3% a year. I'm going to fund an additional 3% a year. So there's not a whole lot of you know, formality to many of these funding policies at this point, um, unlike pensions that it's in statute, right? They don't need a funding policy at Hampshire County. It's in the statute. You must fund this particular dollar, you know, this particular amount, develop this particular way. So as I mentioned, many possibilities for pre-funding. And one of the things that's become kind of popular to look at is, and I keep kind of going back to the retirement system because it's a big part of town's budgets, right? And there'll be a day, I promise, when the retirement systems are fully funded. Maybe not in our lifetime, because I know it's going to happen. What's probably going to happen is legislature is going to say, oh, we had another 2008, close to 2040. We need to extend the schedule. But right now, 2033 is the end date for Hampshire County retirement system. And I don't want to say that your contribution turns to zero, because as I mentioned, there's always a service or normal cost to be funding your new people, right? New people have no, you know, they don't have a liability, but we're trying to pay off these unfunded liabilities. But every year you're gonna get new benefits earned, always have to pay that. And you gotta turn on the lights at Hampshire County. So you gotta pay them some money for administrative expenses. But your unfunded liability will be fully funded according to the most recent valuation by 2033. That's gonna free up a lot of money, right? So what we're doing with some of our clients, we're modeling this kind of process where early years, eh, 100,000 here, a couple hundred thousand, but man, in 2033, there's gonna be this big infusion, not necessarily of the entire unfunded liability, but maybe some percentage of that payment that is being earmarked for pensions. So what's gonna look funny in your budgets is that you're gonna see this, you know, between 2033 and 2034, this big drop. So. Some say, well, let's put that big drop into OPEB. You didn't hear it from me, but I know the CARES Act funding dollars um, can be, um, cannot be used for um, pension bailouts, what they're calling it. But I hear some chatter about OPEB, but you didn't hear that from me. So, you know, you can take that with whatever. Um, so like I said, there's a lot of different possibilities for pre-funding and there's nothing you know, that stops the town from say adopting a policy and then two years later saying that nah, this is not really working for us or we had some change or we had a windfall. We changed our health insurance for all of our active employees. I see that a lot. And we, you know, we saved X many dollars in the next fiscal year. So let's put it aside for OPEB. So there are a lot of different um, things that you can actually do uh, to pre-fund those. And um, that's all I have. Bob Hegner, see your hands up. Yeah, I uh, thank you. That was a very, uh, very uh, helpful um, presentation. I do want to come back to Medicare and what um, aspects of Medicare the town is contributing to. I understand Part B, uh, the premium, you know, the, the 148.50 minimum premium, um, but there's a lot of other parts of Medicare, as you know. Um, there is Part D, which is the prescription plan. There's, for those people who are above certain income levels, uh, IRMA Part D kicks in, you know, if they had a spouse or something. 
Um, and then there's Medicare Advantage plans, which are basically, you know, Part C, I guess it is, um, but they're sort of a substitute for Part B and Part D uh, and other things. So is it only Part B, um, the medical insurance payments that the town is contributing to? No. Okay. So once once retiree becomes turns 65 and is eligible for Medicare, he'll go sign up for Part A, which is right. free. Okay. Use that in air quotes. It's, you know, the, the retiree pays nothing for that. They do pay their Part B premium. Right. And then they choose a Medicare supplemental plan that's actually offered by the town. Okay. All right. So the town is... Um, Acquiring, I don't know, it's not the right word. I'm lost for the word I want to get. They're basically coming up with that plan that is offered to your 65 plus Medicare eligible retirees. So it's the proportion, it's the portion of that premium and part of the part B. Now that Medicare supplemental plan probably includes part uh, prescription drug. And I can flip open again, section five is going to okay. um, it's page 20, Bob in section five. So the MedEx plan is 360 a month, which based on what I know in Massachusetts probably has drugs in it. So that's on top of part B. Okay. So that's the supplemental. Yeah. Okay. And that and covers part that covers prescriptions then. Yeah. So it, it's, it's almost 4,400 a year for that plan, you know, bef not the town town pays 80% of it and the employee pays 20 but the total cost is high enough that it probably has drugs in it. Yeah. Yeah. If it's it's if it's four hundred a a month, it would have to have drugs. Yeah. Because yeah. we have Medex, and it's much less than that per month without the drugs. Do you, is it unusual for towns in Massachusetts to pay a share of Part B, or is that does that often happen? It does not often happen. Um, there, we do have some clients that pay all or a portion of that Part B, um, but that is not, okay. So what the town did many, many years ago is adopted 32B. And 32B is what dictates all the health insurance coverage for public employees. Once you adopt certain sections of that Part B, uh, Chapter 32B, um, right, you're kind of bound to it. There is nothing in there for Part B reimbursement. That's sort of an extra. Okay. Just like I don't think life insurance is part of um, of the Part B, but some towns say, you know, it's it's really an insignificant cost, um, and you know we can offer part of that premium to the town as well, or to town retirees. But Part B is kind of unusual just because it's not really part of, you know, it's not part of 32B. Yeah, I just, We've done some work with some clients where they've, you know, grandfathered some of that stuff out or they, you know, they'll, they won't harm the current retirees or retirees who might retire within X many years from the present, but it might be, or, or like, um, Pension reform, I always say it's like it doesn't impact anyone not yet in the womb. Right? So if you if you just kind of you could cut it off at some point for people who aren't even hired yet. So that you're not taking away a, you know, a perceived promise to anyone who you've already hired. And so those are the ways to kind of get around um, making that change that doesn't impact, you know, people who are already on their fixed incomes, right? Your retirees are the ones who cannot adjust. That's the issue. They can't adjust because they're, they're retired. There isn't a way to, um, you know, to modify their savings or whatever because they're now on fixed incomes. Now, I don't know for unionized employees who, if it's in collective bargaining agreements, any of these terms and... Uh, no, that's something that would have to be. It is, an, about. it is, and at least the um, the school contracts, I believe, the terms. John, you the said terms. is. It is. Yeah, in, it is. Yeah, and that's yeah, what because, we've heard too in other communities that you know that's that's where it becomes a little right. difficult when it's part of the contract. Yeah. Not as much the the terms around 
retiree insurance, but some of the benefit um, terms are in the school contracts because when we uh, switched over to Maya, that was something we had to work through. So we're specifically on the question of coverage of Medicare Part B, would yeah. that be typically in the union contract, like for the teachers? I don't recall, but I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Anything else from the committee in the way of questions? Andy, can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, so uh, Linda mentioned that we've been talking about sort of the, the funding plan for OPEB. Um, and I think our current funding plan for OPEB was developed, um, uh, Andy, you may re remember, it may have been developed with support of the finance committee. It's been um, some time since it's been revisited. And so that might be something, maybe a late, summer, early fall topic we come back to is um, reviewing our funding plan and seeing if it still makes sense going forward or if we wanna make some adjustments. And, and as Linda said, she can model some of the things out for us. Cause one of the, the more important things is to make sure that we can continue to um, have a strong discount rate and, and that we have a strong plan. And so we can model out different things and see what that does. Um, so just throwing that out there is potentially a future topic for us to discuss. Okay, and the answer is, uh... Yes, I was involved. I was done when Sandy Pooler was the uh, finance director. And uh, I mean, a large part of the discussion that Linda brought forward about uh, the connection to the Hampshire County Retirement Plan and when that will be fully paid was part of the calculation, mm -hmm. of, a large part of the calculation of, in that prior discussion of many years ago that I. Yeah, I have a very Hard nice spread. I have a very nice spreadsheet that he left behind that I can uh, <laughs> to update update. So, yeah. Um, well, Sandy left it behind. I'm sure. I will take no credit. Um, other questions? So I think then. Thank you for bringing forward the point that we probably should spend some time after the budget process. Uh, coming back to this, just reviewing the funding plan, mm -hmm. and uh, we can uh, report that to the council as we just generally forward the report. Uh, which none of us will be able to adequately explain because we don't have Linda's years of expertise in doing that. So other questions that people have from the committee for Linda at this point. Um, I, I know we have a couple of public attendees um, and I just want to pause for a moment because if there are any, we do have public comment in all of our meetings, uh, Linda, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that um, I give an opportunity for members of the public who are here as attendees, if they wish, they can raise their hands and I will duly note that and, um, so that they can be recognized. Uh, uh, in the meantime, Dorothy, your hand is up. Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, do we have Dorothy? the slide deck? Has that been made available to us? Yes. Uh, okay, great. It's very, very useful. Thank you. Thanks. It's in the packet, Dorothy, online. Yes. Yes, it's in the online packet. And I believe that everything that it was in what I sent you earlier because we had received it in advance. So I don't see anything from attendees. I um, don't see any further questions from the committee. So. Uh, Linda, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we'll see. You yeah, you're again. quite welcome. Um, any questions? Follow him through for, Sean. He knows how to get in touch with me. And um, for a year or we'll go, uh, yeah, we'll uh, go from Sean here. will come back. Okay, so we will report this along to the council and we will return to the subject after the budget process. Um, to so work with Sean to review the funding plan and uh, 
it's if, if there is still um, is adequate in our needs and uh, anything else from the committee on this subject. If not, Linda, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm just trying to figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Should be you can kick me out. Go time. ahead. That's okay. Um, Andy, question: When are we going to have a break? Do you want to have a? Shall we do a five-minute break and then uh, come back? Well, I'm for one. So. And um, we need to uh, talk about the. We need to talk about the regional schools if we do. Uh, so we do need everybody back because um, we have to make a recommendation to the council and regional school budget. And um, I think that's pretty much it for the agenda. The last item will be very brief. So um, with that noted, uh, we and, Andy, I look just at have one clock question. and assume five minutes. I have one question, Andy. Did we get any additional information from schools? Because I'd asked about... Um, number of people who work there and student population when we had the counts. And I don't think we received anything. Is that correct? Okay. Unless Sean knows of something, I did not receive anything. Sean is uh, shaking his head. The answer to be no. No, I'll double check my email, but I don't um, believe we received anything else on that. Okay. So, uh, um, 347, we will come back. I think we're just waiting for uh, Kathy. Okay, so I'll say everybody's back. Let me just uh, run real quickly. Just uh, confirm that you can uh, hear me and, be, and we can hear you. Dorothy? Here. Okay, great. Bob? Present. Ernie? Present. Jane? I'm here. Lynn? Present. And Kathy? Here. Okay, good. So, Kathy, you raised a question right at the end about um, information that we'd hope to receive. And uh, my recollection of the last meeting, what I know is going to come to process in a little bit, but um, we really did two different things in the last meeting because we both reviewed the proposed budget and assessment. method for the regional schools and we had a very healthy discussion about some of our underlying the budget and um, kind of what the long-term projections are for education funding and uh, the some of the questions like um, what you were Referring to, I think, Kathy, and uh, um, employment data to get data at the longer term questions. And uh, for the regional schools, it won't until May, um, the thought was that um, we were going to see if we could contact the other towns and set up some kind of um, multi town discussion. To um, to get Andy, you're um, our, you're breaking up uh, a little bit. Is is anybody else seeing Andy um, breaking up a little bit? Yeah, okay, yeah, breaking up. Andy, you're going in and out a little bit um, from a 
from a signal Part standpoint. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but I'm not sure what can do. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, we're just event, we're getting uh, bits and pieces of it. Did do you get did you get the gist to run it by or yeah, I think so. I think what I um, unless Lynn wants to except restate it. Last, except for the last part about meeting with the four towns. And I think we agreed that we would try to do that, but not until late summer or early fall. Right. So I guess the um, the question for Kathy was, is the is the information you requested, is that something that can be answered as part of that follow-up piece? Or is that something that I should get a um, check in with Doug and Mike on um, right away? I, th I think it'd be fine to get it later, Sean. I just, you know, I've, I search but can't find if I wanted to look at, um, I want to go back a couple of decades, but I want to look at, you know, I can find some, but I want to look at student enrollment in yeah. middle, middle and high school. And then I wanted to look at employees, people working there by the big categories that were sort of administrative, not in the classroom, and then classroom to the two types that you always put it out and then support staff. Okay. So um, I know what one of the things Doug said, if I went through the line by line, I could recreate total people working there now, but I'd have to add up the math department, add up this and that, you know, I just was thinking, I would just like to see the trend on that. Um, so um, it's partly, it's partly the way I think, you know, when our kids were in the school, there were a thousand more kids, um, you know, in the two systems. And I want to look at it. So, so what has happened to the staffing of the school as the enrollment's gone down? So it's not a particular year, but I can't find a continuous series. So that's right. what I was looking for. Yeah. So, um, so it sounds like what you're looking for is, is as far back as possible, sort of a trend of enrollment and staffing and staffing with subgroups. I know in 2011 or 2012 or so, that's when we sort of adopted a formal staffing trends report. So they'll definitely have um, pretty comparable data in, in a similar format going back to 2011 or 2010. Um, prior to that, I don't know, that's when it, they'd have to sort of recreate some of that to get it to a similar format. Um, so I don't know if 2010, 2011 is, is sufficiently far back I, enough. Well, I think that's, you know, I'm not trying to create a lot of work. So even if they said, you know, if you do 2010, could you do 2000? You know, could okay. you jump back another 10 years? So it wouldn't have to be. Yeah. You know, I think as far back as Excel, as, as they had Excel is probably how far back we can, <laughs> we can recreate because we, you know, even before the staffing trends report, we had, um, we had a personnel cost sheet in Excel that had full-time equivalencies and things like that. Um, right. So as far back as, you know, can, as Excel. And in some of the old finance committee reports to the town meeting, there were some things, right. you know, I'm, I'm yeah. not remembering, you know, I have a couple of them. So I know, for, I think they did for elementary, but it, it's just, yes, it's, um, it's for me trying to figure out what's been happening over time. And then I've been also looking at how much we pay per student um, compared to other towns in the area, or, or then I sort of jumped over to say, what does Wellesley pay? So just, you know, just, and it, it's sort of a, a context for, not not for the formula, how we divide it between the towns, but for the total, mm -hmm. for the, the total uh, for the middle and the high school. So. Okay, so I'll, I'll relay that request to them and, and try to get a timeline for when they could um, have that ready. Okay. Um, uh, two things, I, and by the way, I switched over my connection, um, so let me know if it's better. Um, so far, or not. better. It is? Okay. Um, is, as I recall a report, and I haven't gone back to look at the slides that he presented, but it seemed to me that Doug had presented a couple of years and was contrasting a few years and also was doing some comparisons to towns that we've talked about previously, uh, Longmeadow and Northampton in particular. And uh, so some of that data may have been, they may have been working on it anyway. So we should check that. 
Um, and the other thing that um, would be helpful is when we get to the elementary school discussion, if they can, if that is available for the elementary school presentation, mm -hmm. that would be good to not have to defer that discussion. But as far as the four town, it makes sense for us to just see if we can do it with the other communities. And so I was going to start making some phone calls to uh, the people that I know in each of the other towns and see if uh, there's agreement to, um, a joint process, um, which was kind of what Mike was requesting that it be initiated from the towns and he promised full participation and support for it, but he didn't want to be the one convening it. And that's how that meeting came up. What we have to do today <clears throat> is we get back to the original bottom line proposal that the school committee passed a budget, which has a bottom line number to it and um, an assessment method that went with it. And uh, that is um, what council needs to vote on. And uh, they're looking to us to make a recommendation on that piece in particular. So, um, Lynn, if you don't have it, I do have it on my available to put on the screen. And Andy, Dorothy has her hand up too. I don't know if you didn't see it. Yeah, yeah I do see that. Okay, um, okay. you want the, the budget or the, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I, it was a one pager pretty much. Um, I I'm have it, and, it. Yeah, uh, Dorothy. Uh, just a quick thing in terms of comparing uh, staff, um, I, I and Sean would know a lot more th than I, but I suspect there have been a lot of changes in regulations and kinds of services that have to be provided now that did not have be, to be provided 20 years ago. So we can't just count uh, auxiliary personnel um, then and now in relationship to student population, because I, uh, I just know there's a lot of different programs and regulations. So you'd have to have some of that information beside, in addition to the numbers to make, be able to make sense of it. So that was really, I guess, more for Sean to see. Yeah, no, I agree with, I agree with that, that there's a lot of um, changes that would need some context um, throughout that to, to compare the numbers. Andy, if you have it handy, it's gonna be best if you call it up. Okay. Um, Cause the other thing that, uh, I think that we had heard in the last in, in the last presentation from the superintendent is the point that he's made numerous times, which is uh, one that over the years, as enrollment has declined, that there were uh, programs that were eliminated along the way. Some of the language selection, for example, is eliminated. Uh, the, if I recall, culinary arts program and child care programs were uh, previously provided and eliminated. So it's kind of hard to, you know, I think Dorothy's point is comes in there too, or choices that had to be made as declining enrollment forced decisions to be made to uh, true in programs and the, and the other is and this one I have less ability to put a handle on how to deal with even and that is uh, year to year there's changes in the number of um, special education aids and, spe and other unique special education costs and how that fits in because some of those are employees to the extent that we're doing in-house work so, um, Kathy, is anything you can suggest? Not now, this isn't putting you on the spot. Yeah, I will, you know, I, I, I do understand that it will be rough, but um, <laughs> if you do trends over time and I pull in some from other towns when we're talking about larger regulations, that's affecting everyone. And I know the charters, the charter advent of charter is pulling money out of a budget in a different kind of way. This is just 
We used to produce some of these numbers and getting continuous numbers would be great because I can go to Desi. But I just thought it would be great um, to be regularly producing them. So my suggestion is as follows um, that uh, you and I and Sean and, and the other members of the finance committee want to participate uh, Certainly they can let me know, but the, at least the three of us have a conversation about what it is that you're looking for, and then we can see if we can explore okay. what's possible. Okay. Um, so what I, let me see if I can, it's going to be always hard to do this while you're also being the one, but I'm going to try getting over to shared screen for a um, moment and see if I can get to the right thing that we need to have up on the screen. You did, no. you did the agenda. In the I know I did. Um, I'm having a little bit of problem because of this question of and I'm happy to do it too, Andy. It which tab or... Andy, I can bring it up too if you. You have um, it. Yeah, yeah, you just okay, want the. Um, you do you that. want the one pager that shows the assessments? The one pager. It's I think what we want because I think that's what we're really going to ultimately what the, what we have to decide we are recommending. All right, give me just one second, it's... and I will pull that up. It's on the. I'm just pulling up what's on the website, so I'm just going to share my browser for seconds. And there were there were three parts to it, Andy. I've got it on my iPad, but it was the assessment all, method, and then it was the dollars. Do you all see it on the screen? Is this what you were looking for, Andy, this um, chart here? Yes. I don't know if that's, is that big enough? Large enough? Yes, so um, now in uh, correct, me if I'm wrong, but the re uh, recommendation from the school committee is the terracotta sixty five percent. Yeah, the, no, no. yeah, it's the it's the red, the the reddish color. So the numbers that we would be recommending are um, the budget and the assessment as shown mm -hmm. in the. And we have the orders we can bring up too if you want us to bring the orders up. Yeah, I think the, um, that that would be helpful to do next to, to switch over to, to the order in a moment. But um, are there any questions about what it is that the committee is recommending, the school committee is recommending? Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the chart that's currently on the screen, because uh, we're at this point still feeling that there are long-term things that we would like to understand, but um, we have to recognize that we have to vote on a bottom-line budget request and um, an assessment method, and uh, that's. Um, I think we would need a motion ultimately, I don't want it instantly, to recommend that. And these are the numbers that are reflected in the order, um, correct, John? Yeah, they should be. We can double check them, but that sh these should be the numbers in, from the order. And just... Uh, um, so Kat Kathy has her hand up too, if you were... Kathy, you go ahead. Okay, it's, it's, it's not so much a question on the numbers we're looking at, which are very clear, and the, the, the Amherst share, the increase of 2.1% was what we gave them in the guidelines. You know, so the school, the regionals come in within our guideline. So my question is the larger context when we spoke with Paul, when we spoke with Paul at the council level, on whether um, when the discussion of public safety was happening, on whether 
there would be any recommendation to put some of the money if we change the way we do policing into a school budget to offset something. And Paul said that would come, we'd see that in May. So I'm just, the question on the regional budget, since everything is tied to the other towns and we're just a share of it, I'm assuming those decisions would not or will not affect the regional school budget. And this is the town manager deciding what what if other. So it's it, that's my question that we're looking at. They gave us a list, some of which were cuts um, that got us down to this number, actual cuts in people or staff. Some were one-time savings and other kinds of savings because of uh, reduction in enrollment. So anything else that would happen would have to happen at the town manager level, but I'm not sure it could happen in regional because the other towns would have to pay a share. So that's my question, yeah. Can I speak to that a little bit, Andy? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Kathy, that it would be hard to for those changes to impact through the traditional budget process here um, because any increase that Amherst brought forward would then increase the other towns as well. And they all have town meetings that they have to you know, prepare warrants for and things like that. Um, so I think it'd be difficult for that to happen through the traditional process. Um, you know, I think one somebody brought up potentially gifting money at one point. You know, I, I don't think that's been done before to the region, at least not since I've been here, where there was sort of a separate gift from one town. Um, not to say we couldn't explore it if that was the direction that the town went, but um, I'm not sure how viable that is either. I think that was a suggestion from a uh, public comment, not from a counselor. Right. Well, and, and one counselor also raised it, but it was, you know, in this larger context. Um, yep. Okay. Thank you. Dorothy? Um, I guess I must have missed some discussion. I never thought that money from the police budget was going to go into education. I thought we were asking for social workers um, and responses to problems that the police deal with right now, but giving a, 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 a broader variety of responses. And you want to respond on that? Lynn, you're muted, however. Thank you, Andy. The town manager's budget has to be made available to us on um, May 1st, however, May 1st is a Saturday, the following day is a Sunday, so it will be made available to us on May 3rd. Until we see that budget, we will not know what his recommendation is going to be, and as you know, it has to be an up and down. Um, I Up, down, you know, take this out, you can't add things in, you can try to advise it. So I just want to be very clear. We have never had a conversation as a council that said, take money from the police budget and give it to the schools. There have been comments made by people in public comment. There, may have, in, there have been comments made by a counselor, but we have never had that discussion. Okay. So uh, anything else, or uh, if not, I'm gonna ask Sean if he'll switch over to the order, the proposed order for the regional school funding. And, and then I will go back and see if there's public comment um, one more time because uh, we're now into a different subject. Do you see the order on the screen, um, Andy? Yes. I think you've got the perfect orientation of it. So I'm looking to see. Uh, I guess there are the, there were two orders come to think of it. So let's stop for uh, do this under. There's actually, yeah, there's, the there's three total. Number. Oh, there are three? Yeah, there's the, Well, that's right, because there's the, a third. The debt. Capital. Yep. 
and then the yeah the, the so the number uh the number on that matches um what we saw as far as the total budget yes yep yeah this should be the if anybody has it they can double check it but this should be the total budget from the 65 percent and this should be the the amr share Let's see, 16, 783 yeah. is what I wrote down. Yeah, I checked. I so. checked, and it's an exact match. Okay. Not surprisingly. Yes. So, um, does any, I mean, at this point, the appropriate um, motion would be to recommend these three orders um, for adoption by the council. Someone wants to make that motion. Andy, I'll go ahead and do Lynn, it. Um, I recommend. Motion. Yeah. Lynn? Thank you. I'm moving to recommend to the town council approval of order FY22-01, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District assessment method. I second it. Okay, we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? And um, I'm gonna say to the public, who are here as attendees, if you raise your hand, I will assume that you are asking to speak as public comment and I'm going to recognize you before we move forward in actual vote on this or the other two proposed orders. So seeing no one raising their hands from the public, I'm assuming that there's no request for public comment on the regional school budget. And um, so I see no hands raised from the committee. So I'm gonna presume that uh, there's no further discussion. And I'm gonna proceed uh, to recognize each member of the committee. And of course, the I am gonna recognize resident members of the committee as we go through. We are not gonna record um, their votes as votes, but we're going to record whether we, they want to be indicating their support of the motion on the table. And that's, um, so as you call, you, if you're a member of the council, then um, indicate uh, your vote. If you're a member of the uh, committee who's not a counselor, indicate whether you support the motion and I am um, just going to go in order as they appear on my um, panelist list. So, um, Dorothy Pam. Yes. And um, Lynn Griesmer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. I support the motion. Kathy, Shane? Yes. Uh, Jane Shuffler? I support the motion. Uh, Bob Hegner? Uh, I support the motion. <clears throat> OK, and, I, and I'm voting yes. So the vote is for to zero, no abstentions, one member absent, and three resident members of the committee indicating their support. So uh, I think we can proceed to the next order. Sean, you wanna put it back on one more time on the screen? I scrolled down. Did it uh, scroll with you? Okay. No. At least it didn't on mine. 
Are you not looking at um, FY22-02? Yes. I can see that. Okay. Andy, this, this is now the dollar amount rather than the share. Yeah, rather, I, the first was the assessment. Yes, now it's on there. Okay. Okay, Lynn, I recognize you. Your hand is up. Yep, I move that we recommend to the town council the approval of an appropriation and transfer order FY22-02 Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget assessment. Mm. Your second? I second it. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing no uh, request for discussion, we'll proceed to vote on the same way. Um, I'll start this time by indicating that I am going to be voting yes. Um, and Kathy? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bernie? Support the motion. Um, Support the motion. Jane? I support the motion. So again, the vote is um, four to zero, uh, no abstentions, one member absent, and three resident members indicating their support for the motion. So, um, Sean, I guess we have one more order, and that is capital. And I scroll down on this one too, so you should see it in a second. Yes. It's there. It's on. So this is a, um, just as a reminder, it's $500,000 aggregate amount. Um, there are, it's broken into three parts below in a chart to show how the um, numbers are derived and what the intended uses are. Um, the, um, other thing that I will point out is that the uh, assessment method that we previously voted on does not apply to capital um, debt authorization. Capital debt authorization, according to the regional agreement, is done by a separate formula that is entirely the EQV in each of the four member communities. Lynn, your hand is up. Okay. Uh, I, um, I, I'm going to move that we recommend to the town to council that they approve order FY22-03 Amherst Pelham Regional School District Capital Debt Authorization. I second it. Your second. Okay, it's been made and seconded. Any further discussion from the committee? I do. And according, I do. I do see that there are two hands up, so we're stopping for discussion. Uh, Kathy. Sorry, I didn't, I'm trying not to slow us down, but um, as Andy knows, he was on the Joint Capital Planning Committee and Sean staffed it. The $15,000 for renewable energy study, we had recommended that the town manager take the resident proposal for solar canopies and combine it, consider the, these two as part of a study. So I would just like our report to recognize, to cross-reference that, Andy, when we make this recommendation. I'm completely for this, this entire piece, but just to signal out that, that there was a discussion of that $15,000 in JCPC also, and it's in front of Paul to decide how to make all of that work. And I'm assuming Sean so that you. I'm assuming Sean that that Doug and others were aware of the, the two pieces because it actually came from some high school students. Um so yep. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about the report and when we conclude this. So uh Dorothy, you had your hand up also yep. when the I was wondering about the exhaust fans and the unit ventilator. Um, 
I guess I thought maybe things like that might be covered with CARES money. Yeah, so can I weigh in on that, Andy, real quick? Yes. So that's a good observation. Um, you know, I'll double check with Doug. My guess is those are not eligible because I know those two particular items have been on the region's capital plan for quite some time. And one of the things I know it cares is if it's if it's something that you've sort of identified as needing replacement and you're kind of replacing it as it comes up on your capital plan that they are not uh, deeming those projects eligible. Um, so I can, again, circle back to Doug if, um, and see what he thinks on that one. But that's my guess is that it's they're not eligible because they've been on the capital plan uh, before COVID happened. They could be slightly changed, I would suggest. No, I know. I, I, you know, we work with, we yeah, work with the state a lot. So it's they're, they're pretty strict on um, eligibility criteria. So there is a uh, the rescue plan funding is um, still being discussed, debated what's in there. And so there's always a possibility that, that can supplement or, or uh, be put in place. But for now, we know what we have. Sean, it's my understanding, but you will know better than me, that if uh, a decision is made for any reason not to go forward with the project, that we will have, if the council votes and the other town meetings agree, are, 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 uh, that there's $500,000 authorized, but that doesn't mean that they actually have to spend or uh, sounds for the 500 and if they if it ends up that it, uh, something is dropped from the list to the later date. Um, yeah, you broke up a little bit, but yeah, just because this is a, I think what you were saying is because this is approved, it doesn't mean they have to borrow the money. It's just given the authorization to borrow the money. Um, and unless the town of Amherst votes no on this, then it would it would become approved unless one of the other towns votes no. This is this is the one that you don't have to have a vote on. You just, um, only if you were gonna vote it down, you would have to vote on it. But you can also vote affirmative if you wanna send that um, positive message as well. Sonia has her hand up, Andy. Yeah, I see Sonia's hand is up and I see Dorothy's hand is up still. Sonia? Yeah, I just want to clarify that we're not really authorizing borrowing. This is just the capital plan that the region pretty much submits to us every year. And for the most part, we've never really voted this or approved this. It was just a letter that they sent us that this is the plan. And unless we had, we had like 60 days to contest that plan if we didn't want to cover it. But when we switched over to the um, council government, we started to do this order to approve it, but it's not adding to our authorization for debt. This is the region. So basically what we're saying is the region is telling us they're gonna, they have a plan for $500,000 and they normally borrow for all their capital projects. We're saying that yes, we will pay our assessment of this $500,000. Just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, Sonia, that is helpful that you pointed that out because you are correct that in actuality um, it is a negative the way that it's stated in the regional agreement so that we would have the other towns don't necessarily have to vote yes, they just have to choose not to vote no. Exactly. So uh, but we have decided to go and affirmatively say something in large part because of just how the timing works out that it gives us the ability to make a decision. Uh, but in any event, okay. So can we proceed to a vote? Um, I'm gonna again start by saying that I am voting yes, Lynn. Yes. Dorothy? Yes. Uh, Bob? I support the motion. Bernie? Support the motion. Uh, Kathy? Yes. And Jane? I support the motion. 
Okay, so the vote is again four to zero, four in favor, zero opposed, no abstentions, one member absent, and three resident members indicating their support. So that concludes the business portion of this. What I was going to do is try tomorrow to do a draft of this, uh, of the school, regional school section of a report and then send it to the committee um, just so that comments, but comments would have to come back solely to me and uh, that'll, um, and I'll try and get Kathy's point in, but um, if Kathy, if you want to just write up your point, you're welcome to do that too. And we'll, and I'll just plug it in. Um, so you're welcome to head it that way. Um, does that sound like a um, reasonable plan to the, to everybody? And then just see if there's agreement. So the last part of the um, discussion today, the last item on the agenda, really gets back to um, the um, calendar, the budget calendar for the year. And um, our, our plans for the next council meetings. And as you've now gathered from the discussion several times over, um, we do realize that uh, when you look at the um, charter, um, the charter very clearly provides the due dates when they fall on a weekend, get extended to the next working day so that the only change to the budget calendar that was presented to us dated 4121. At this point is that um, where it says town manager budget and capital improvement program due to the town council would change to 53. But um, I don't think that there are any other anticipated changes at this point, which means that on May 3, there's a council meeting which the budget would be Discuss, presented for discussion purposes and um, referred to the finance committee and uh, as well as the uh, capital improvement program, which I believe is ex um, also extended to um, May 3 for the same reasons. And uh, that that's uh, essentially the agenda for our next meeting. Any questions on that? Is that a, Bob? Yeah, it's not a question, but a request. Uh, as per last year, I would appreciate a hard copy of the budget document when it's available. Yeah, um, Andy, can I respond to that? And one other thing real yes. quick. Um, so yeah, I think we can, we can make sure that happens. And then the one thing I don't think we did, and maybe it can be done via email, is um, committee assignments of which committee members would be responsible for reviewing what sections of the budget. Um, last year, we sort of like divvied it up. Um, I don't know if we wanted to do that again. I guess not. the question for, the, yeah, the question to start with is whether that was a useful exercise last year or not. No comments. Well, I, I think it helps sorry. people focus. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was useful. Um, Bob and I did public works and the enterprise funds, and he raised some things that I hadn't thought of, and I thought the composite was good. Um, so I, I just thought, and then we did do them in advance. So I, I think doing them in advance is good. Um, so I found it useful. I did do questions on every piece myself too, but it was really nice to know someone else was focusing. Um, and then I got assigned library at the last minute because um, one of the people that was gonna do it couldn't do it. Um, so I found it useful. Um, it, I read more carefully the one I knew I had to come up with questions. 
And I'll add, Andy, that this the, the budget document's a little bit different this year too. So it might be good also for that reason because we, we made some updates to the budget document um, that might help people focus in on so that because it might it might be a lot of new material some areas so i would say that i think um i would prefer to have andy assign me my portion because he have would have a good idea of no, I'm, I'm... so we have public safety public works community services general government library, elementary schools, um, enterprise hmm. funds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You might want to, yeah, enterprise funds could be their own section. So are there any specific requests? So the, and you can and also email me your request. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is Bob. I'm, I'm happy to do public works and enterprise funds again, since I looked at them last year, unless somebody else wants to do it. <laughs> okay. If I'll you do don't want to say now or Kathy? I was just going to say, I'll do public safety and fire. The two. Public safety and fire together in one section, I believe. Um, we're taking on an interesting one this year. Uh, that also includes dispatch and animal welfare. Yeah, I'll take the whole group, Sonia. <laughs> take the whole group. You take one, you're taking them all. Take them all. Do it. So, uh, General Go Dorothy, do you have a? Well, probably I could, I could you do a library. The library because, I could do it because I have a helper, but would that be a conflict? No. Nope. Okay. No. You'd like to do library. Um, Elementary schools is the one that I think is actually an important one. Let's go jump on that one. Yeah. Lynn, you'll do elementary. Yes. Okay. I'll do community services then. Or uh, maybe. Jane, you don't have to, if you, since you've not done it before. Um, what we try and do with this is just to go through it, become a little bit more familiar with it. If there's any um, overarching questions, we try not to uh, bother the staff too soon, but we certainly want to make sure that somebody's um, being prepared to lead with questions. And, um, sort of take a little bit of extra time and be prepared to lead with questions. And if there's something that's really problematic to be able to kind of uh, through Sean, um, raise the questions initially, if it seems like there's something that's just totally missing in information that you think is essential to get that to Sean. I, I would love to, to take a section. Uh -oh. Just give me whatever you want me to have. I'm happy. I'll take whatever. General government's um, pretty exciting. <laughs> get, the, get the accounting office. Can, uh... Ooh, sign me up. Sounds like a rock star. <laughs> okay. Um. It's the best section. <laughs> Obviously. That's where you're located, right? Okay, so um, Bernie, you're the one who's who seems to be left out, but that's that's the way life is. Uh, Bernie, Bernie can help me with schools. <laughs> I, whatever, I like me to do. 
Oh yeah, we need something for conservation and, and, and planning and inspection. Oh, that's, so. that's right. Planning and oh, conservation. Okay. So Bernie, is that okay? Planning and that's fine. Conservation. Yeah. Thank you. I knew I was missing one. So Pat, because she wasn't here, gets away scot free. No, 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 no. It's what's leaving. No, I'm going to, she'll okay. probably end up wanting to work with Kathy on uh, public safety. That's what she did last year. No. Yes, Glenn? Nothing. And public works and enterprise funds are two big sections. So if, um, if you wanted to split that up, you could. It's up to Bob and you guys. I, you know, actually, they are big, Sean, but because of the way they. Interrelate, uh, yeah. Yeah. The staff, like 50% of a person is in one part, and it, that was hard mm -hmm. to sort out where to think we weren't counting people twice. Um, right. So for that reason, it was useful. Um, okay. And can you just, you know, when we, I know we're doing rates, water rates next time, but um, I'm going to, I'll send you questions through, through Andy, but, you know, when we do water and sewer, just trying to figure out whether we're nearer to knowing what the cost of Centennial is, and then is it built into the rates or not? Mm -hmm. would be a question I have. Okay. So. Okay. So I think that we're set on that. I don't have anything that was on the anticipated 48 hours in advance. If nobody else does, I think that we can call it a day. And uh, the hard work is yet ahead of looking looking at the budget book, is it going to be as as thick as in prior years? Um, have you I don't it? know. It's a, it's a surprise. It's a inline version. <laughs> yeah, we're looking forward to the surprise. Yeah, it'll, it it'll, used to be that the big surprise every year was the color. Yeah, it'll, it'll be thick, but we're also trying to do as much as we can to make it um, digestible depending on how much you want to get into it so there will certainly be you know executive summaries and we're trying some new stuff with um brianna and communications that um some story mapping stuff that might make it easier to go through so um so i think you'll get the best of both worlds hopefully um lots of information but also if you don't want that much information just enough to get you by i thought it was going to be a graphic novel Right, and, and I Almost. Be down for a paper copy too. Okay. So it's at this point. And, and, and we want to be able to, be, no. to win a GFOA award too. Oh yeah. But Hopefully, it's closer. It began to feel a moment ago like okay. this reality show, and you're uh, telling, this is your task. This is your task, and then we're all going to have to go out in the field and pull the papers, and they would the tension would be building up as we do a review, and then come back in and bring it in. Kind of that feeling. Lynn is looking at me skeptically. <laughs> I want a paper copy. That's all I want. I think it's. I, I think that means it's time to adjourn. <laughs> so uh, there's no objection. I'm going to declare yeah. us uh, adjourned at uh, four thirty nine p.m. Yay! Thank you.